Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, Texas, and welcome to the podcast. Um, if you are new, I'd encourage you to uh, visit our website at Two Way Prayer, and uh, gives you kind of some background on how I got interested in this uh, prayer practice that uh, was going on in AA uh, in the very early days, and I was sober about twenty years, and never heard of it, and. Uh, so I started studying it, and it's totally changed my life, and hopefully we're in the process of helping other people change theirs uh, by introducing them to the to the practice. To uh, help with that, uh, we, we had been doing a monthly uh, workshop on two-way prayer. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break this summer. The first uh, one we will be doing is going to be in August, on August 28th. Uh, that will be... Uh, through St. Mary's of Swanee in Tennessee. They're sponsoring that event. Uh, unlike the other workshops, this one you are going to need to uh, register for it. It is free, but you do need to register. That'll be on Saturday, August 28th uh, from 10 to 1 p.m. And that is uh, Central Time. Also gonna be doing some uh, some new things in, in the fall, uh, doing a workshop on the... Um, on the 12 steps, kind of a practical history of, of the steps, what what learning some of the history uh, might help you in uh, in doing them more simply. I think Dr. Bob would be really happy about that. And uh, but just pra some practical uh, um, um, information uh, coming out of out of the historical way. That the, the, that the steps evolved. And then we'll be doing a couple of more workshops in the fall on two-way prayer. So go to, go to the, uh, the website that'll have the events listed. And if you haven't signed up with the newsletter, please do that. We'll also keep you posted through that uh, vehicle. And you can write me at twowayprayer at gmail.com. Uh, I'll sign you up with the newsletter or you can do it on the website. Okay, businesses out of the way. And um, we're continuing our series now on the pioneer prayer practices, the, the methods of prayer and meditation that they were doing in early AA. We've been using Dick B's book, Good Morning, since it's uh, probably the best uh, single source of information uh, for exploring some of, some of this information. And uh, in this episode, we're going to be uh, looking at the 11th step, uh, but very specifically, we're going to kind of, kind of be looking at uh, uh, why some of the things made it into uh, AA from the Oxford group uh, and why some were left behind and why some were uh, uh, seemingly lost in the process. But I'll tell you, once, uh, once I began learning about two-way prayer, uh, it, it, it changed my understanding of the big book. I had been reading that for 20 years and, uh, and th thought I understood it, uh, uh, always go deeper. But once I understood this prayer practice that they were doing, uh, then it brought the steps to life for me in a wholly new manner. And it particularly helped me with uh, step 11 because that was the one that I always struggled with. And uh, I find that I'm not alone in that. A lot of people stumble around with uh, prayer and meditation and, uh, and have some difficulties in that area. So we're going we're gonna to get into a bit more of that uh, in this episode. And I kind of wanted to start off on, uh, on why it was that, uh, that when Wilson was writing the big book, when it came to the, this 11th step, the prayer and meditation practice, why wasn't he more upfront with everybody about uh, two-way prayer? Uh, but he kind of um, is vague about it. So uh, kind of getting ready for the, this episode, I, I pulled out my 800-page copy of uh, writing the big book by... Uh, William Shaberg, and uh, thought I'd review what he had to say on the 11th step. And I, I found it interesting because I think he hits the, the nail right on the head when it comes to this process. 
so he says he says in his book, uh, this is on page 487, uh, Wilson notes that it would be easy to be vague about this matter of prayer and meditation, but instead he says that he would like to offer, quote, some definite and valuable suggestions. And then uh, Sheberg begins his analysis. He says, here, Bill faced a serious challenge. It would be easy enough to make suggestions about prayer using generic language that would please most everyone within the fellowship. But the Oxford group had a very specific way of doing meditation, which they called quiet time the purpose of which was to receive guidance directly from God. This method was still being faithfully practiced by Dr. Bob and by most of the other Ohio members of the fellowship. If Wilson were to talk about meditation by explicitly explaining the particulars of quiet time and the desired guided result, the knowledgeable reader might well have identified this as an Oxford group teaching. And this was an association Bill Wilson was determined to avoid. But if he were to leave out any direct references to quiet time, he was just as likely to offend many of the Akron and Cleveland people who were so devoted to that practice. It was the one Ohio practice that Frank Amos had noted members, quote, must have every morning a quiet time of prayer and some reading from the Bible or other religious literature. Unless this is faithfully followed, there is grave danger of backsliding, unquote. Uh, Schaeber continues, uh, Bill managed to walk this thin line by interspersing several Oxford group beliefs and practices throughout these, quote, definite and valuable suggestions on meditation. But he did so in such a way that they would not readily be identified as having come from the Oxford group. Now, that that wasn't new information for me, but uh, I like that I'm able to find uh, an outside source uh, who can verify uh, the belief that I had, that that's exactly uh, what, what was there. I mean, I read the big book, and once I understood two-way prayers, oh my gosh, there it is, there it is, there it is. That's what he's talking about. But why wasn't he clearer in his explanation? And the reason was that... Uh, uh, Oxford group was pretty solid and, and uh, entrenched in the, in the Ohio area under Dr. Bob's influence. And Bill and the New York group was wanting a much more universal kind of approach uh, to things uh, and did not want to be identified with the Oxford group for, for a number of reasons. And I've gotten into those on some previous podcasts. Uh, so, um, One of the key Oxford group concepts uh, was that God has a plan for my life, for every life. Uh, And, you know, it's not just his plan is is for us to stay sober. God's plan is, is what is going to be revealed to us through the guidance that there are specific things that he wants us to be doing. Now, that came as new information as well. Uh, I knew he didn't want me to drink. I knew he didn't want me to run. Uh, I was a runner. Uh, But to know that there was very specific guidance, uh, that I only got by my study of uh, going deeper into the Oxford group. Here's a, I always love the, some of the quotes that Dick has managed to put into his books. And uh, this is a nice one that uh, comes from Stephen Foote, an Oxford group member writing in 1935. He said, I will ask God to show me his purpose for my life and claim from him the power to carry that out. 
See, when you start reading this Oxford group material, you start hearing the big book uh, in another language, the power to carry that out. A.J. A. Russell, uh, author of For Sinners Only, another Oxford group, a book from the 30s. He's writing about the connection between God guidance and God power. Uh, and again, he stresses, uh, this is a quote, God had a plan. They were trying to fit in with it, the Oxford group people. Knowledge of that plan, God's guidance and God's power were available for all who chose to work in with that plan. This guidance and power transcended every form of self-determination. God guidance in God's strength could be the normal experience of everybody at all times. And that was one of the things that uh, uh, Frank Bookman was convinced the world really needed to find was that there was not going to be a new form of um, material materialism, communism, socialism, fascism. There was not going to be an answer to the world's problem through any one of those mechanisms. What was going to change the world was people listening for God's voice, finding God's voice, uh, and, and most particularly, particularly living the absolutes, the honesty, the purity, the unselfishness and the love, uh, the things that really are at the, the root of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So some of these hidden references uh, to guidance that, uh, that you see in the big book, Dick, uh, Dick B. has a, a listing of a number of those. I thought it might be uh, helpful to kind of go through them with the understanding that uh, He's really talking about the guidance that comes from two-way prayer. Dick says, there's scarcely a part of the big book that does not involve requests for God's guidance and direction, following our several examples. Page 13, I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I was to sit quietly when in doubt asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Page 50. They found that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. 57. When he drew near to him, when we drew near to him, excuse me, he disclosed himself to us. 67. God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. Uh, 69, in meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. Um, page 79, we ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing. 83, we clean house with the family, asking each morning in meditation that our creator show us the way of patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. Uh, he goes on and on. Uh, 164, famous one, ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. Uh, and oftentimes that man is us. <laughs> you know, what can I do for me uh, in my situation? Uh, the answers will come if your own house is in order. Um, this guidance, we've talked about this a little bit before, but uh, Dick goes into it uh, in a little bit more depth here. I mean, I just think you just have to be careful. It's, it's not that... Uh, Oh, if I sit down, God is immediately going to guide me. A um, couple, of, couple of quotes that are, I think, important to look at in regard to that. Uh, Bill Wilson, writing in the book Pass It On, says, While most of us believe profoundly in the principle of guidance, it was soon apparent that to receive it accurately 
considerable spiritual preparation was necessary. And, and probably the greatest preparation for that, of course, I mean, we have this, the surrender that we, we go through, um, uh, the taking of our third step, the uh, sharing of our secrets in four and five. Um, but then the big one is six and seven, where we become uh, ready to have God remove every defect of character, everything that stands in the way of our usefulness to him and to our fellow man. That's that's the spiritual preparation that's really uh, being talked about when, when they talk about... Uh, being made ready to receive the guidance, uh, to bring that attitude to my prayer. And, and that's something that I have to do uh, on a daily basis, because if that attitude is not there, if that six and seven attitude is, is not um, alive in me, it can become rote, it can become mechanical. And uh, very easy for the ego to slip in. But when that, uh, what some would call the second surrender of six and seven is present, then I'm, I'm looking for what is God's will, what is his guidance for me for that day. And I'm uh, much more likely to receive it in a, in a profound way if that's the attitude I bring. And uh, and so I'm sober going into my 49th year, you know, but uh, I have had multiple uh, surrenders and I'm not saying that they were each a third step. I don't think that's the way to do it. I think it's all a part of that uh, 11th step uh, that, that, that we draw closer and closer. And, and as we do, we become more and more aware of the things that still are separating us from God. Wilson Wilson uh, said that AA was a spiritual kindergarten, and I love that that phrase. That uh, this is, uh, in in one sense, just a beginning uh, of of a spiritual journey that that will go on uh, for the rest of our lives. And if we can if we can latch on to that, then AA or whatever twelve step program we are in becomes an adventure. It becomes excitement. So I'm 40, going on 49 years in December, uh, sober. Um, but I feel like a newcomer. <laughs> you know, I feel like in, in many ways, my spiritual journey is at, at the beginning, uh, because it's got, it's got so, so far to go. Um, the absolutes for me are, are the key uh, to the the program these days, uh, James Hauk, the Oxford Group member who got sober the day after Bill Wilson, I visited him. I've mentioned this before, but he said two way prayer. The guidance is all about the absolutes. It's all about l trying to live honestly, purely, unselfishly, and lovingly. And that's an attitude. That's 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 the adjustment. It really has to happen in our psyches, in our souls. And when that happens, then God can really use us. Um, Sam Shoemaker, a couple of quotes that Dick has there that I like. Uh, one, he says, uh, be leery of half-baked prayers and self-made religion. And that's um, in, in reference to... Uh, being very cavalier about this two-way prayer business, that if I just sit down, pick up my pencil, God's going to talk to me. I, I don't think that's accurate. I think what is much more accurate is that I am beginning to uh, enter into a new relationship with God. And that's, that's where the excitement comes in. And it's uh, part of the cure for the, the spiritual malady, the spiritual sickness that is really at the heart uh, of addiction. Um, quote from Shoemaker here that uh, Dick gives us. He says, whatever misery persons of the present day might experience 
within the ranks of religion, one cannot see that many of them are faring much better outside. Now, the thing which is striking about much of the misery one sees is that it is spiritual misery. It is the unhappiness of spiritual people very often, souls who are too fine-grained to get along without religion, yet who have never come to terms with it. It is the maladjustment to the eternal things, and this throws out the whole focus of life. Rest cures and exercise and motor drives, car trips, will not help. The only thing that will help is religion. And when they say religion, they're talking, they're talking the spiritual connection. For the root of the malady is estrangement from God, estrangement from him in people that were made to be his companions. What you want is simply a vital religious experience. You need to find God. Well, that's to me what, what the big book is all about. It's a, it's a roadmap for that. Uh, it's, a, it's a roadmap that if we do understand the Oxford group roots out of which so much of it came, we'll then be in a position to start practicing this two-way prayer business, and that is going to open up that relationship between you and God to levels like you have never experienced before. Uh, quote from the big book, uh, lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power, capital P, greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. That means we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we are going to talk about God. Um, did, did a series on um, Edward Edinger's uh, description of, of a lot of Carl Jung's work on, on the psyche, the soul. And, 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 and they're, they're saying the same thing there, but, but they're saying it maybe in a different language, uh, that, that the soul is rooted uh, in God. It has its home in God. And, it, and, and at some level of the psyche, it is still connected to God. Um, and, and that is the part of us that is in touch with God. And I'm convinced that uh, that is what we are hearing when, when two-way prayer is really being properly practiced. It's not God whispering in my ear. It's, it's my soul telling me uh, uh, the, God, the God reality that is within me giving me the guidance that, that, that steers my ship, you know, uh, this way or that way, because it feels right. When does it feel right? It feels right when I'm connected to it. It feels right when the ego is properly sized and not taking on the God function itself. I mean, it, everything comes down to that. You know, God is everything or God is nothing. So, so am, am, am I using the will properly uh, or am I trying to bombard all of my problems with it? Um, he has a quote in here about the darkness and I, uh, I like it. Uh, it's from the big book, but he says, um, and this is in closing his book, uh, that's why I think it's important. He's, he says, the less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself. As we became subjects of King Alcohol, shivering denizens of his mad realm, the chilling vapor that his loneliness settled down, it thickened, ever becoming blacker. 
Some of us sought out sordid places, hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Momentarily we did. Then we would then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to face the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Unhappy drinkers who read this page will understand. Well, uh, in thinking about that today, um, I, I don't think that's a one-shot deal. I don't think that's uh, um, a thing that just happened to me 48 years ago. I think that's a place that lives within me to this day. And I can go to that place today. And I can, uh, I, my world can become very dark, you see, uh, and terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. Those live inside of me too. You know, the great reality is within, uh, but the great unreality <laughs> is, is within also. And so it makes such a difference uh, whether I am in touch with the living God and God is living through me and I am in right relationship with him and I am listening for his guidance and direction uh, in my daily prayers or if my ego is, as we say, large and in charge and uh, blundering through the world, making a mess. He ends uh, his, uh, his book with a favorite quote of mine from Dr. Bob's story, where he's, Bob says, if you think you are an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, or have any other form of intellectual pride, which keeps you from accepting what is in this book, I feel sorry for you. If you still think you are strong enough to beat the game alone, that is your affair. But if you really and truly want to quit drinking liquor for good and all, and sincerely feel that you must have some help, we know that we have an answer for you. It never fails if you go about it with one half the zeal you have been in the habit of showing when you were getting another drink. Your heavenly Father will never let you down. Um, well, not only will our Heavenly Father never let us down, our Heavenly Father is alive within us and wants to talk with us and wants to be uh, um, made manifest, uh, incarnate uh, through us in the world. And when that happens, we come alive. And when it doesn't happen, we start to die. And um, so that darkness, uh, like I say, it's, it's not just pre-drinking. It's, it's an ever-present reality that helps me uh, when I come close to it. I start feeling, what, restless, irritable, discontent. It means I uh, have drifted and I need to get back quickly in line the line that connects me. Uh, and there's, there's, there's the operative word, connects me. It's conscious contact. It's conscious connection. And, and there's a vitality that, that comes with that that is not about just not drinking. It, it's about learning how to live and learning how to live a way of life that is exciting and fulfilling and filled with love. So... Um, uh, we'll do one more uh, episode on on this uh, this uh, series and wrap it up next week and uh, see what maybe it has uh, taught us. Uh, so look forward to to doing that one and look forward to having you join me. Take good care. God bless. And like Bob says, keep coming back.